The way to, to think about what we're going to try today is um, this is a akin to a cooking show. And what I'm giving you here is a cookbook. Um, so what I mean by that um, is, uh, and if you can't get this document open, um, you know, please signal us. Um, I do have a PDF version uh, right here as well. We can put it in the chat if you need it. Uh, but what this this document is here to provide and what I'm going to walk you through over the next hour is the essential pieces, the, the tools and the parts um, that will give you a, a, a sense of what the OSF is and why it, how it's valuable to you and to your research. Um, but what I don't want to do is, is tell you exactly how you should go and use the OSF. That's not my intention. Um, I'm giving you the, the tools, though, so that you can go and apply those to your research the way that you want to. And the OSF is really flexible that way. Um, so I want you to, I don't want to stifle your creativity by just like prescribing every single step. So you're not going to see things cooking in the oven. We're going to, we're going to show instead the really critical steps. And then, uh, as we wrap up today, I hope you'll, you'll go and try some of the stuff um, that we introduced you to in the OSF and apply it in your own ways, uh, to your own work. So that's our, our goal for today. Um, but again, uh, use the Q and a, if there is something that you're, um, in particular getting stuck on, um, then we will be sure to, to answer those. Um, so Amanda is going to throw up a poll here, uh, and that's just to give us a little more information about yourselves as you're uh, joining our event today. Um, and uh, if you are familiar already with uh, the OSF and whether you have an account already is our um, what we're just trying to get a sense of uh, today. Um, and this is whether you already have an account and you're very uh, familiar already or um, you have an account and have only dabbled or you don't have an account at all. Um, either way, uh, you are welcome in this uh, event um, and this will help contextualize uh, all the features, um, the, the major features of the OSF um, and even might uh, point to some features as a familiar user that you haven't used before. Um, so thank you, Amanda, for pulling that up. I'm just watching those. I don't know if everybody uh, can see it, but a lot of folks do have OSF accounts, but uh, the familiarity is, is um, uh, varies um, with some being um, uh, not quite as familiar as they may want to be. So I'm hoping we can uh, help you change that today. Um, cool. Thank you, Amanda. Whoops. Get that poll out of my view here. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about the OSF. And in just a one line explanation here, um, the OSF is a free, it's open source um, online platform. And, and the idea is that it's designed to support researchers, not just having open and transparent uh, work, but also supporting them in each stage of the research life cycle and making each of those as transparent as possible and responsible. Um, and there's lots of other tools that you use that probably have some similarity in terms of um, you know, their, their goal or what they offer is that um, they can make your work open and transparent, which is terrific. We don't want to uh, dissuade you from using other fantastic tools in our space. Um, but we USF is unique in that it is supporting across each of these phases of the research life cycle. And we love this this image here because it just kind of captures all of this in uh, one shot. Um, and remember this because we're going to talk about it a few times uh, through our session today. Um, and what's linked here uh, as an example of what we're going to be doing uh, throughout the session goes right to uh, the OSF. If you don't have an account yet, or if you're not signed in on the page, you're going to see is a little different. Um, just as a heads up, Oops, zoom stuff in my way here. Um, so that will get you right to the OSF. Um, and I've linked here some more information about the OSF here. If you do want to continue 
to read more about uh, the basics of what the OSF is about and where we come from and um, the Center for Open Science, which supports and maintains uh, the OSF. So you can welcome to read more about that. We won't uh, talk more about the, the basics here so that we can jump right in and start playing uh, with some of the features. Um, but please do ask uh, any questions if you have some. And Blaine and Mark, um, flag me if we do need to um, pause and, and actually um, talk about anything. All right, uh, so for those who uh, responded that you don't have an account or um, you couldn't recall, um, we'll talk just for a couple minutes here about signing up for uh, an OSF account so that if you wanna follow along, you actually can just do that in just a few minutes here um, and you'd be able to, to do all the other activities that we're going to do briefly uh, today. And as you'll see here and you'll see in several of our subsequent sections um, is that I've linked a few things for us so that everything you, you all the essential resources you need are right here in the same document. So there is a help document. Um, this is in our support center, which has lots of great resources. Um, this one specifically is about creating an OSF account, uh, since that is our topic for this section. So this is a really detailed um, walkthrough on how you would do that. Um, and if you use that link uh, that is in that uh, right here, you will actually get to, let me just go ahead and log out so you see the same thing that I do. There we go. So you use that link, you'll get right to the <laughs> registration page. Uh, and if you don't have an account yet, you can go ahead and, and fill this info out um, and you will have to confirm it with your email address. So just remember to, to do that. Um, you can also sign up with your uh, ORCID ID or your institutional credentials. And we'll talk a little bit more about how this works um, as we go. Um, but an ORCID identifier, if you don't have one, um, is a persistent identifier uh, to identify you as an individual, as a researcher. Um, and I heartily suggest uh, that you get one if you don't have one already. Um, and then many platforms in research, you can use your, your ORCID ID uh, to sign in to uh, those platforms. Eric, and not to interrupt, but would you mind zooming in so you can make that a little bit bigger? It's hard yes. for some of the participants to see. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Um, there we go. Um, and if you are coming back to the OSF, so you have an account already, um, then the sign in page looks similar. Um, stuff out of your way here. Um, so obviously you could set uh, an email and a password to always come back and use those on the OSF, but you can also sign in um, with those same um, alternate credentials methods. So if you have your ORCID ID credentials, sign in using those. Um, and you can also set up two-factor for uh, your profile on the OSF. So just one extra security step, um, which probably your institutions will recommend. Um, so you could set those up as well. So those are our steps right there for ORCID registration. Um, and signing in if you already have your account. Um, so what I also have linked here is a little bit about those institutional affiliations. We won't spend too much time on this, um, but we do have um, institutional members, so partner institutions that work with us to build toward one another, their, their communities and what they need. Um, and they include OSF and in those essential uh, tools that they wanna provide for their community. Um, so you can read a little bit more about that here, but as an institutional member, what that uh, enables is um, users can then sign in to their plat uh, to the OSF using their institutional email and password. Um, and there's some uh, data that the the institutions then get to to gather and makes your reporting of your progress and your work to your institution um, that much easier, that much faster. Um, so it's a neat feature um, that. All of your institutions that are here today may not have that, um, but um, if they're interested, uh, your institutions are interested in being part of that, um, then you can reach out to us and we can talk about it. 
All right. Um, so now if you just signed up or you're just signed back in uh, to the OSF, um, then one thing we're going to just going to do here quickly is how you see a little bit about yourself or tell uh, the rest of the OSF community um, about yourself. Um, and so there is a, a profile um, that doesn't have an abundance of information and we don't want to, um, uh, again, to dissuade you from getting an ORCID record, which is really uh, super valuable for uh, exactly this, telling your community all about your work. Um, but this will tell the, uh, if an OSF user sees one of your uh, data sets or one of your papers that we'll, we'll talk about here shortly, um, and they wanna see more about what you do, um, then they would navigate to your OSF profile. All of the, um, the profiles have a unique uh, identifier of their own that you can use to, to share um, to share this profile page with your um, communities if you like. Uh, and then what I advise is that you use that ORCID sign-in, even if you don't sign up originally um, into the OSF with your ORCID record, you can still sign in and connect your ORCID ID to your OSF profile. And now if I come to see, you know, who is this? genius gentleman, Eric L. Olson, I can see his work on the OSF, and then I can also uh, navigate over to his ORCID record and see all the cool stuff uh, that he does. Um, uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about where this information goes in the OSF, um, but those are a few things that you can do just in a few seconds as you set up your account uh, on the OSF. Um, and then down here, you'll see uh, this link goes right to your profile page if you're already signed in um, because the, the URL isn't trying to guess your, um, your good, which is this identifier here. Um, but if I were to put this link up here, I would also get to my profile. Um, so that's where that link is coming from. Um, and then again, there's a few help guide, pref um, help guide uh, references here um, so that you um, can see how to go and edit more of those fields. We won't do that here today, so we can keep moving along. Um, but those resources are there for you um, as you experiment and add things to your uh, OSF profile. So again, we were talking before, and let me just scroll up again to our image here, because um, we're now we're really getting into using the OSF and then we have a profile we've signed in to our um, into the OSF as a user. Now we can really dig in and start to do um, you know, some of these research lifecycle activities. Um, and you know, we're fortunate that uh, we're doing this today because we have just over the last few weeks um, released a whole bunch of new search and discovery features that are just really, really neat. Um, so I wanted to spend a few minutes on these. Um, you'll see here linked a help guide with really detailed instructions on how to use all of the, the search features. Um, but I'll just show you um, here live and you can go ahead and play with this uh, as much as you like. It's all uh, released in public um, features here. Uh, but this new OSF search uh, will search across all of our object types on the OSF, which we're going to chat about here in just a just a bit, um, but you can obviously use the um, the search terms and a few of the common um, search methods, like um, quoting a phrase to search for exactly that phrase. Um, and you'll see down here, like with a Google search result, uh, for example, you'll get exactly where. The context that tells you where that con um, where that term appears throughout uh, this content. So in this case, uh, we have keywords that mention open science, and in, on this one, it, it's in the title rather than uh, in the keywords. Um, so the search itself is already uh, really neat, um, but what really takes this above and beyond are these filters here. Um, and in the document, I just grabbed one example and link to a guide on how to use these filters. Um, but what is really cool about these is you could stack a bunch of these filters um, to get exactly the kind of work that you're looking for. And on the flip side, as we're going to talk about shortly, um, you can add this information to your own work so that it can be discovered in the same way. 
Um, so just even by narrowing all the way down to content that has open science uh, in the um, in the metadata, there's a little over 6,000 results. Three of those were funded uh, by uh, Institute of Museum and Lim uh, Library Services. And within that, I could continue to narrow that down to the institutions, um, well, just us here at COS um, that have content funded by COS. I can look at uh, resource types and the licenses that are on uh, that content. Um, so if I actually, let me just go back here and just start from the filters. So you don't have to enter a search term first to use these uh, these tools. And look just at things funded by the National Science Foundation here in the US. Get to 30 results. I can see it's seven of those are data sets, two are journal articles and so on. Um, probably a variety of licenses that we enable to uh, on the OSF. So some really, really neat things you can do um, with this tool here. And what I'll just do is uh, grab a couple. And uh, then the next piece that I have on your document here is you can construct these um, these queries. So let's say uh, if you are uh, part of a, an institution, um, one of those institutional members that we mentioned earlier, and I'm gonna pick the very first one, Macquarie here is in Australia. Um, so they wanna be following uh, obviously the content um, from their community on the OSF. And they even want to narrow that down further uh, to only be seeing things that are uh, CC by licensed and maybe just what's only been created this year. And now, so they have this stack of, of filters that um, they've added up here and they don't have to come and, and recreate this every time they want to see what kind of progress they have on exactly this this year. They can just copy uh, their URL here, put it in their uh, reports. And then every time they open this page, it will uh, reload with any new uh, results that meet those same criteria. So really, really useful for this kind of reporting purpose. Um, and for obviously for um, defining a few of these terms or filters that might be beneficial for your own research. Uh, and obviously you're getting understanding of the quantity of, of research really quickly. Um, that are in those areas. So really, really cool features that are here and available for you uh, to play with now um, with discovery on the OSF. And uh, the rest of these references here are a few more resources for the help guides. And I also have a, um, a video reference that captures one little piece of the video that's specifically about this research discovery. So now we're getting into, we're, you know, we've, we've done a little discovery ourselves as a researcher and we're into really our own study now. I've done a little lit review, uh, understanding what the landscape is in my particular area for my study. So if I'm in my planning research phase, uh, there's an opportunity um, as I'm scrambling to get all of my things together for my study, I know how those things are sort of taking shape and eventually would appear in a my manuscript, my paper that I submit. But what would be even better is if I took all of that that I know because I'm I'm in the process of putting it together, I can actually document all of that at the very beginning of my uh, study and then have that be a reference uh, throughout my own you know, research life cycle, but then I'll, at the end, as I complete my study, I can then reference to it. And uh, now there is an element of transparency from beginning to end uh, of a study that a manuscript alone uh, really can't uh, accomplish. Uh, so that is a process we call uh, pre-registration and uh, the, the registries, registrations workflow that we have on the OSF that we'll look at here shortly. Uh, is what enables that pre-registration practice. Um, so I have some uh, several resources here um, about pre-registration if you want to go and read and more about the, the details. Uh, but really, the, the thing to take away from it is uh, you know you, you're you very likely have been asked to be providing data management plans now uh, for your funders or institutions or both. Um, and this is very much like that. Um, you are describing, uh, instead of just 
how your where your data is going to go and um, who is going to have access to it and how it's going to be preserved, you would answer those same sort of questions, but for the entirety of your study. Um, so all of the um, anticipated variables and populations and sample methods and all of those things, uh, which of course may evolve as your project continues, which is fine. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment. But now you have a, a time stamped uh, document that you can refer to about your study at the very beginning. Uh, so uh, a practice that we do advise, but um, let's look a little bit here at the using this registration workflow um, to either prepare that, uh, that planning phase, or you can be using it to, to archive um, some of your work from later in the research process. So there's a guide here for um, starting a, a registration. And actually, if you use this uh, second link here, goes directly to, whoops, um, looks like I doubled up that link, sorry about that. Um, goes right to the submission page uh, for research registrations. Let me go ahead and fix this link here. Um, so you'll see what the submission page looks like here. Um, and what I've uh, captured for you in the document is that the next couple of steps, and we won't do the entirety of, of cooking this bird, um, of putting a, a registration in, because uh, it is a, a process that you would want to put some thought into um, as you're submitting these. Um, but one of the very first things you're going to be confronted with um, is it's asking you about the type of registration you want to submit. And you'll see right at the very top, um, the pre-registration and a couple of versions of pre-registration, in fact, um, that are based on how different communities interact with the same kind of concept. Uh, so rather than we just tell everybody, go and use this one that we've created, um, and what we'll do is build a template um, that is using their own uh, set of questions and priorities, and then they'll use the OSF infrastructure to complete those. Um, so there are details about each of those uh, registration templates um, right here. Uh, and this is also in the OSF, so you don't have to go very far uh, to see these. Um, and these will tell you a little bit about which communities are using those um, and what their typical um, uh, utility is, uh, but there's, again, there's lots of flexibility here, lots of options in terms of um, what you can use this for, because um, if you've already completed your study, you might you definitely don't want to uh, pre-register that, uh, but you might want to submit a time-stamped uh, snapshot of where you are in that work, <clears throat> excuse me, and archive uh, some of the, the data and progress. Um, so this is a good opportunity to do that using this workflow. Uh, one of the things that we'll ask you to do, and I've used, uh, just connected to some help guides for this, but um, after you've completed uh, filling out one of these forms, and I'll just start one so you can see what it looks like. Um, so once I've completed one of these forms here, um, it will ask me to submit and have that approved. And um, a registration is something that uh, is meant to be public eventually, even if you want to embargo those for several years during, you know, as your study is, is going on, um, but eventually will be public. Um, so we ask that you and any others that you um, have as collaborators at a high level um, on your study will have to approve those uh, before they become public. So there's an email that is sent that, uh, you know, even if um, Mark here, my colleague, was included on my registration, he hasn't had a chance to review it yet, maybe he would get an email that says, Eric submitted this for review, um, you know, check this out, and then you can turn it around and, and not approve it if it doesn't meet um, your standards or is missing something, and then we can go back and, and uh, complete that draft again together. So I have some guides here for uh, approving that. And then if you, you know, start and get halfway through your uh, registration, you don't have to complete it. You can actually just walk away and, and save that draft. Um, and if you do that, 
Um, and you're if you're already logged into the OSF, you can use this link here. Um, and you will, we have a page specifically for your uh, draft and completed uh, registrations. So you can see the one that I just uh, started here is in review state or is in uh, in progress. Um, and I can continue to edit that and add new uh, contributors to it as needed. Um, so that link there will go right to your um, your registrate my registrations page if you're logged in. Um, if you want to navigate to it, it's right up here um, while you're on the registries interface. Um, but that same link will always get you there if you're logged in as well. And then just quickly, because we referred to some of the really um, interesting metadata that is available uh, on the OSF, you'll see there's a few metadata fields that we collect right away. So we want to know, obviously, a title and an abstract. Um, we need to know who your contributors are, who are your, your colleagues that are working with you on this, um, and then your um, a license that you want to apply to your, your work. So we collect that right away. And those are... Um, uh, that metadata is available um, and visible for a researcher after the fact. Let me just pull open one of mine here, and you can see what that looks like. Let's see, you go grab this one. So you're, here's the web metadata that I submitted uh, originally when I submitted my registration. But then there's also uh, this metadata tab right here um, where I have even more fields and some of the ones that we just saw in the discovery uh, uh, life cycle phase um, where I can add resource information, so what kind of uh, data or object is this? In this case, this is a, an event. Um, and then who funds this work? And we use the, uh, the uh, Crossref uh, funder registry for this. So if you are, um, you know, part of a, you yourself have funding or you're part of an institution that struggles with getting this kind of funder reporting from your uh, researchers. This is one of the ways we're trying to, to help them out um, by making this really easy to get the right, uh, the name for their funder and then uh, in an identifier that they don't have to go and find uh, behind the scenes. Uh, we'll just apply that here and send it um, in the metadata. So it makes this reporting much easier because I just, I know that the NIH's National Institute's something like that. If I start typing that in, I can just pick it from the list that I'll apply precisely that funder, that name, um, and that identifier to the work. So it makes it much easier for uh, some of those uh, reporting needs from the funder's perspective, but also for you as a researcher, as a, uh, as a research support person at an institution, um, just saves a lot of, of frustration uh, by having those, uh, those steps there. Uh, and then you can also update uh, your registration. So as I mentioned before, um, you can uh, go to that same draft uh, registration page here. Whoops. And on my ones that I've already submitted, um, you'll see I actually have updates in progress for some of these. Um, but if I want to continue or if I want to update one that I haven't touched yet, I have this update button here. Um, and what that will ask me for is which fields uh, that I've already submitted previously do I want to update? And then I also have to justify, um, include a justification text of why I've made those changes. And this isn't to prevent you from um, wanting to make those changes, but rather to just be transparent about as you've made those changes over time, um, just including real clear uh, articulation of um, what you had to change and why. Uh, so that is why we have the those steps there is because we know things change. We know that you have to to adapt your project over time. And so that updating workflow is there and available for you um, in that process. And you can also see um, in one of the uh, studies, I don't know if I have a extra version on this one, but um, you can see I, in my case, I'm a, a contributor on this one, so I can update it from here. But if it had multiple versions, I would have those all available here in the dropdown, and I can open exactly uh, that version. So as a reader, you'd always see these uh, this dropdown on a registration and check to see if it has other versions. 
Uh, we also have registries that use our infrastructure, um, but they themselves um, operate uh, independently um, in terms of their content uh, decisions. And so you see a few of them uh, right here on the, excuse me, the OSF uh, landing page for registries. Uh, and so these uh, work, they, the, the technical capabilities are the same, um, but uh, they are for specific communities or disciplines or uh, organizations in this case, um, a funder who um, has their studies pre-registered um, and then managed uh, on the OSF. And so their templates might be a little different because their communities are have different needs, um, but the, a user would submit them in the same way um, to one of these registries. And most of these are, um, are open to, to for submissions by uh, anyone. There are some exceptions where they are, um, uh, their workflows are a little different, uh, but you may see uh, that you have um, your work overlaps with their community or with their purpose. Uh, so you can submit your registrations there. Uh, and then I've included a little bit more uh, info here, work, uh, help guides and other resources. If you have questions, if you really want to dig into registrations, it, it is uh, pre-registration in particular, that practice can be daunting. Um, and if this is the first time you've ever heard about it, I understand that completely. Um, so there, there's work, there's resources here that will help you get started. Um, but don't hesitate to reach out to us and, and get some help on that because Mark here in particular uh, is, is an expert on, on how this practice works, particularly within the OSF. So please do reach out to us to talk more about that. So that's our planning phase, that early phase of that research life cycle. And you know, if we're moving from the research plan into we're, we're in it now, we're in the study, the study's happening. I have collaborators that I need to get looped in. Uh, that is where this workflow we call OSF projects comes in um, because this is very, very flexible. It doesn't have the same uh, really rigid um, workflow that the uh, pre-registration might have. Um, instead, it's open and changes over time. Uh, and so there's some guides here on how you might do that. Um, but if you're logged in, this was the very first page you saw when you logged in or when you created your uh, OSF account, and you might not see any uh, content down here in the lower portion just yet, uh, but you do have this create a new project button, and that's what we're going to look at right now. Um, in this, we will go ahead and just uh, create one. You can create one alongside with me if you like, because um, you can always come back and, and play with it again later. So there's some essential metadata here. I'm going to just call this my workshop project um, so that I can find it later. Um, you may not have uh, affiliations listed here the same way that I do. These are those same uh, member affiliations that I mentioned earlier. Um, but if you are, if your organization is a member and you use that sign in uh, with your institution process, then you would have um, affiliations available. Uh, but for this case, I'm going to go ahead and turn those off. Um, and then I have this storage location. I have this uh, documented too, because there's um, this seems like uh, a really critical question because it's asking you for where to put your, your data. But often this is a, a really simple answer um, in that your institution or your funder um, or other organization you may be accountable, accountable to, um, they have an expectation of where research data um, will reside. Um, and so, for example, in Canada, there are many, many uh, regulations about research data that is part of uh, Canadian institutions and, and generated in Canada that they reside in Canada. There's some Canadian um, uh, participants here today. Um, so I'm sure you've heard this and, and repeat this many times in your community. And so for that Exactly that reason, uh, when you come to the OSF, you can uh, have the storage location for your projects be in uh, Montreal in this case. Um, we also have storage locations in Australia and Germany, in addition to the US. 
You can also set this as a default for your, yourself as a user. So every time you start new content, that uh, or that storage location will be uh, included here, which I would advise if you are in one of these other regions. Um, so that is what that storage location is asking for. So you probably have a real, real simple um, which one you want to choose there. Um, and then we'll go ahead and, and create our project space. And what you'll see here is this blank slate. Um, so there's not um, uh, a lot of structure to this yet um, because I've just started it. And so what I've included in our document here is uh, some information on how to use the, the metadata fields. They, they have some of the same ones that we saw uh, before um, with the registration. So I can include the funders and the resource types. There is also this uh, wiki, which is exactly uh, what it sounds like. It is a, a space for you to um, define your protocols or to discuss the objectives of your project. Um, it's in markup, so you can do a lot of of cool um, style and structural things in this space. Um, and then you can also upload uh, files to this same location. You'll see my um, Canada storage location here. And I'm just gonna drag one of our screenshots from today's drag and drop right into this uh, storage location. And now I'm starting to share uh, data. In this case, this one is still private and I could start adding my contributors to it um at a later time um and then again as i mentioned the the structure is what really makes the osf projects unique and we don't really have a lot of structure right now um but using components which are or child projects uh to start filling in a directory uh is an opportunity for me to to start building in that structure so um I'm just gonna call this one our October 18 workshop to identify as part of today's event. Uh, and that will add this uh, child project to the directory. I can also link completely separate projects, whether they are mine or belong to someone else uh, to this one so that there is a relationship between them um, here on the OSF within my project. And then if I've gotten to a point where um, I would be comfortable making this project public, um, I'm probably not going to do that in this case. It's kind of a just to demonstrate for you, but um, I can make this public at any time um, and that will reveal this content uh, to the world. I can also just add individual contributors to it um, and give them permission to interact with this work. And once I make that uh, this project public, I can mint an identifier, an object identifier, a DOI, uh, for this project space. You're getting them automatically with uh, the registrations that we talked about before. Here, you make the conscious choice uh, to mint one of those. But again, we send all of the metadata to a uh, data site when you mint a uh, DOI for your project. Uh, and then in your project space, you also have this add-ons tab. And this is a really neat, uh, again, unique element of OSF um, is that we do have the, the storage that I just showed you that we enable for you on the OSF. But a lot of you, um, your institutions or yourself, you, you already provide uh, storage solutions that you're using for collaboration and you're sharing your data through. And we don't want you to have to copy those back and forth and have different versions all over the place. Uh, so instead, you can integrate those tools directly into the OSF, this project. And now those same uh, data, those same files, they aren't being copied from uh, like Google Drive, for example, to the OSF. It's the exact same folder, the exact same file uh, files. Um, and your, you and your contributors can continue to, to collaborate on them and modify them um, and yeah, note that activity in the, the log here. This one won't have a lot of information yet, um, but it really helps with that cross institutional collaborations that sometimes uh, these tools, these storage tools themselves may not gracefully enable, um, but the OSF using a project like this um, can really help with that. 
Uh, so we have that for several storage providers as well as um, citation managers. So you can have your entire uh, bibliography for um, a study. It's in a Zotero library already. You can just sync that um, to your OSF project and it'll appear uh, without having to copy and paste anything. Uh, so very convenient. So that is using um, OSF projects. There's some pieces here that um, a lot of even our, our frequent users um, aren't uh, utilizing all of the time. Um, you get this cool uh, dialog box over here. And what that uh, enables is a conversation, uh, discussion between, um, in this case, it would just be just me on this project. But if I add more of my colleagues, then we could have a conversation here in this comment section. If I make it public, then any OSF user could come and leave a comment on um, on that project and say, hey, oh, wow, this is really neat. Can we please uh, connect sometime and talk about it? I have a similar study. Can we work together? You know, things like that. Um, and uh, the user would get a notification that there's a comment been left on their uh, content and go check it out and see if there's something to uh, respond to. Uh, so really neat feature there. Um, and then there is an analytics page. Let me open up a, a public project here because the private projects, we don't provide um, analytics for those. But once you make your project public, let me use one that we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, once you make your project public, we provide this analytics page here that you can have um, refer back a whole month um, that will tell you if, if folks have linked their project. We've talked a little bit about links before. Forks we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but you can see when you've had lots of activity. You can see we've had uh, some real jumps a few times just in the last uh, few weeks on this particular project um, and where within your project they are uh, visiting uh, and where they've come from. A lot of them have come through um, OSF search probably in this case. Um, others have found it through Google searches. Um, so every public project uh, has that has this analytics page. Um, they don't have to be your project in order to, to see it. Um, any public project, you'd be able to see their, their analytics. Uh, so a neat feature to, to try out. Um, and then, you know, it's, this is intimidating when you get into one of these uh, projects like the one we were just on um, that it, not just just white space. There's a lot to, that I have to think through to to turn this into what I'm envisioning in my mind. Um, but I'm one of the things we've tried to do is is make that a little easier for you, at least for a number of use cases. So this OSF project here that I have uh, linked under this templates section has exactly that. Um, so if you are uh, trying to work out how to use the OSF. Um, as an electric uh, lab notebook, which is a use case we uh, we hear about and see frequently on the OSF, I created a really high level, straightforward uh, template for that exact use case. Um, so this has a few examples of things um, that you might use your your wiki for. So it has a table and um, uh, some experimental setup instructions, things like that. Um, and then it has several uh, structural components here uh, that refer to different sections that I probably would want in my ELN, including the, the lab notebook itself, any other related literature, protocols, materials, and so on. Um, and so if you wanted to use this, just take this exact uh, template and use it to start your project instead of starting from the blank slate, you can use these tools right here um, to do that. So you could fork uh, this project. A forking is a, is a um, you know GitHub developer term largely, but uh, what it, that means is that it will copy everything that's in this uh, this template here, including any files that are stored um, in here. It'll include all the wiki content. Um, it won't include me as a contributor, but everything else it will will um, come over with that copy. Whereas duplicating the template won't take the content, it won't take any of the files or any of that, but it will duplicate the same structure. So these sub uh, children 
projects, the components will have the same names. They'll be structured the same way. So if I wanted to, um, I mean, if you, if you wanted to walk out of this room uh, today and start an ELN on the OSF, uh, then you could just make a template of this and go to town. Uh, you'd be ready to go already. I do have some example, like actual ELNs uh, in here uh, as well. If you wanted to to use one of these as a um, instead, um, you can template and fork anything that you have access to on the OSF. Um, so a good opportunity there uh, to start content without having to really go from uh, from square one. And uh, we mentioned collections just very briefly. And what OSF collections are is um, like with those registries we mentioned earlier, these are uh, communities that um, want to aggregate OSF projects. So that's the same workflow we were just uh, chatting about um, that are related to their uh, subject areas or their communities. Um, so as a user, if you've developed an OSF project that is public, you may want to, in this case, it's about um, ultrasound research. Um, you can add your content to this collection. Um, the focused ultrasound folks moderate, of course, the, um, the content that would be uh, available in their collection. Um, so, but if it's relevant and strong research, they will include it in the collection. Um, so a good opportunity to explore the collections that are available here and see if any of them are uh, relevant to your work and you might want to submit to. All right, so we're at uh, the tail end of our research life cycle. We're ready to start sharing our work. And I'm going to go through this a little quickly so that we can uh, spend some time on some questions. Um, so the links here, what these will uh, take you to um, are our guides for starting a brand new uh, preprint on the OSF. And I'll just go right back over here and show you uh, what that start looks like. Um, and anytime you want to start your preprint, there's a great big uh, button here that uh, will let you get started. And just like the collections and the registries, there are multiple communities that run um, uh, preprint services on the OSF infrastructure. So you can submit to any of these. Um, they are moderated. So um, you know, if your content is appropriate, though, they're very likely would um, uh, allow your submission. Uh, the OSF preprints is not moderated currently. So if you were to go through this workflow right now, um, your preprint would be public very quickly. Um, and so there's a number of metadata fields here that we're trying to, like with the registries and the projects, we're trying to enable you to tell us um, uh, about your uh, research and not just having a, a file thrown up there. Um, so you'll tell us about um, uh, the disciplines that you're coming from and you know, your contributors. And then you can also uh, add one of the OSF projects we were just talking about. If you have relevant data that wants to accompany your, your paper, your preprint, um, then you can associate that here as well. So you can make a connection between your projects and your preprints. And then if you ever need to uh, edit your preprints, um, so ones that you've already submitted, um, then you can always use the, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about this page in a minute, but you can always use this page to come and see all of your preprints. Um, and if you are signed in and you are the create print button there. All right. Um, so last thing I want to show you um, is on a uh, registration. So we talked about the registrations before, uh, but what's really cool um, is one feature that registrations uh, enable, um, which is trying to demonstrate uh, open practices, and we provide actual badges for these, and you've probably read about um, open practice badges, open access or excuse me, open science badges before. Um, and so we capture those practices on the research registrations, the one document you started at the very beginning. Uh, so what's really neat is you submitted this at the very beginning, and then you went and um, developed a lot of data that might be on your OSF project, uh, like this one. Uh, might have code that was on GitHub that you've associated through add-ons to OSF. Um, and then you might have papers like the preprints that we just submitted uh, through that workflow. 
I can connect all of those through the, the DOIs to my registration, so the beginning of my uh, life cycle, uh, and then the end, all the way to the papers. Now, all of that is associated and together. Um, so when we sit the, submit the metadata or update the metadata for this uh, registration document, it includes all of those relationships. Um, so if anybody were to discover this work, um, they can also discover all of these and cite them and use them. Um, and as much as possible, uh, enable the opposite as well. So papers, um, you know, formal publications may also collect your pre-registration information, and then they've included the relationship in the other direction as well. Um, so lots of exciting possibilities there in terms of the discovery we talked about before and uh, the impact on your um, the the reading and using and citation of your work because all of those relationships are now available. Um, and I just have a little reference in here for those that are in the Google Doc version um, of what that looks like on the OSF. So that's our, our walkthrough here um, on the OSF. And we'll leave a few minutes for questions. But the last section here um, is a few more uh, resources that um, will point you toward our support center. So all of those guides that we looked at before, um, we have a tips and tricks section, which um, as it suggests, it's uh, using some of those same resources, but getting right to some particular practices you can take advantage of. Um, you can sign up for some of our future webinars and events. We'll be doing something like this again in the future. If you want to send folks to it, please do. Uh, if you have something an organizational partnership or membership that you want to talk about um, with COS and OSF, there's a contact form right there um, that you can um, use to reach out to us. And you can reach out to support, of course, uh, as well. And we're always here to provide technical support. So all of that to say, um, I hope this was useful in, in getting you some context um, so that you can get in there and start cooking your own um, studies in the OSF, you have enough of the resources um, to, to help you, but do not hesitate to come and reach out to us. We want to hear about where you get stuck or um, an idea that you have for a feature that is not quite there in the OSF um, or creative ways that you have found to use the OSF that might not be in this, um, in this overview here. We want to hear about that. Um, so Amanda will throw up a, a quick poll just to get some feedback from uh, today's uh, session and, and what might be useful for the future. So please do complete that. Um, and then in the follow-up email, um, it will include all of these resources that we looked at today. This document will be in there, but you do have access to that already. Um, and then uh, if there are questions or, or suggestions for things to include um, as well in, in the follow-up, we will do that. Um, so Thank you, thank you for participation. Um, I see a lot of chat and questions, so I'll turn it over to Mark and Blaine and see if they can read some of those out for us. Sure, I can go ahead and read them one out. Uh, one is from Kim, where she asked, just to clarify, could she have grad students download published data for reanalysis on published projects? And would there be permission steps to do that? Yeah, great question. Um, so I'll actually use, whoops, that one's private. Uh, let me go back here and just open up a project. Um, but we didn't get into uh, licensing too much, but on all of the workflows that we talked about, um, you can set a license uh, for how your content should be reused. So whoever submitted the, the data that you're asking your students to go and take a look at, uh, hopefully what they've done is apply a license that is um, allows reuse, even with an attribution like this one, then you're freely available to, to go and download and, and start to reuse those uh, in any way, as long as you uh, have an attribution for the original uh, author, you can download them despite what their license is. It doesn't matter what their license is, but you might not be able to reuse and publish those uh, unless they have a license that enables it, um, but can always access and download those at any time.
Awesome. And then we have another question from, um, I think it's Renee, forgive me if I mispronounced that, but can they upload large data files as in multiple terabytes of imaging data, or is there a suggested path to take care of such cases? Yeah, um, we do get this question a lot. Um, and we'd probably want to chat, uh, Renee, about your specific use case, but um, using our storage, using this OSF storage here, we have some limitations to this. You can actually see our little calculator up here that tells you how much storage uh, we're using so far in this project space, very tiny to this point. Um, and we have limits to how much you could put in this particular container. Um, so you could put five gigabytes because this is private and 50 if it's public. And each of the containers in my directory are calculated separately. Um, the problem would be if one of those files, any one of them is enormous, you know, so 10 gigs, then we can't support a file of that size. And trying to break up terabytes of stuff into this many containers, you know, at 50 gigabytes at a time would probably be difficult. Um, if you do have access to any of the storage add-ons uh, through your institution, or even an add-on maybe that doesn't um, isn't supported yet, then come and talk to us because that those don't calculate uh, into our storage uh, caps at all. Um, so you can connect that; it would still all be available on OSF, um, but would be stored on those uh, providers. Um, but yeah, let, let's talk about your specific use case, and we could probably help um come up with a, a way to make it work all right and then since we're coming up at the hour i have a question which is if they have additional questions or if they want to dig a little bit more into the different um, workflows and services where should they reach out to yeah please do um at the very bottom here uh let me move some zoom stuff out of my way um use the the support address here for general questions on um, how you're using the OSF or what you're stuck on as far as implementing any of your um, OSF work. Uh, if you wanna talk about uh, your whole organization or your whole institution working with us, uh, then use the, the contact form here. Um, and if you, you know, pick the wrong one, we'll direct you in the right place. Um, but either way, please do reach out to us and we'd much rather um, hear from you and help you than um, you know, have you stuck uh, and languishing and without being able to make progress and so reach out to us and we'll help you. Um, I did see some questions about uh, the languages that are supported and um, there are actually in the support center, let me just bring that up um, since we mentioned it, uh, right down here, um, we have help guides that are, we're up to one, two, three, four, five, seven languages, including uh, English, uh, and this is always growing. Um, so there is a lot of progress being made here, almost entirely driven by volunteers. Um, so if you want to come and contribute to this, please do reach out. We would love to talk to you um, because this is a huge amount of work, but is very, very valuable um, in terms of what it provides to, to folks like yourselves and others in the community. So please do reach out to us about this as well. All right, we're one after. Thank you all for joining and for filling in the polls and for participating. It was a really great uh, session. And you will hear from us uh, in the next couple of days with all of the follow-up material. So hope to hear from you again soon. And thanks for joining.